Okay guys, so today I'm coming to you with some feeder insect husbandry tips, tricks, and general advice for four common and easily bred feeder insects. We will be covering mealworms, superworms, crickets, and discoid roaches as well. Let's start off with mealworms. What I have here are three containers of concentrated mealworm eggs. This is what drops through mesh bottom enclosures. Once collected, I place a moisture source in and wait at least one week. These were collected three different times, one from my larger colony and two times from my smaller one over the course of three weeks. After my waiting period, I will add the collections together. Not everyone does this, since I do not currently sell worms directly, I do not keep them perfectly sorted by date. I used to keep each collection separate, but I quickly began running out of space. I do large collections before finally sorting them out by size with my sifter in a month or so. This is before. I have several bins growing with various sizes of worms. Worms I intend to use, let pupate, or fast grow. I keep without any substrate at all. I feed them lettuce leaves, or other veggies every day. I give them just enough to barely have anything left over for the next feeding. This keeps these guys gut loaded, fat, and ready for consumption by your pets. They thrive at temps around 80 degrees Fahrenheit for best growth, so keep them warm. Now for superworms, every 10 to 12 days I rotate these egg collectors with the ones in my rearing bin. I give the set in the rearing bin a knock on the side to remove any worms living within and then place them with the beetles. I keep a constant supply of moist food for the beetles and clean their bowl out once a week for particles of food from them eating. Once the eggs have hatched, I tend to and feed the worms in the same manner I do mealworms. Lots of lettuce and veggies. Ones that are approaching pupation size are kept alone with no substrate and fed only veggies. I want them to have a lot of moisture and a lot of nutrients in them before they reform their entire body. I used to give them a banana, but I have since learned that it is mostly a moisture thing and lettuce is a viable replacement. However, bananas are still an excellent choice as long as you remove the substrate and only give them enough to last them one day. Once I have enough worms to see movement in the mulch, or see them collecting under the flattened toilet paper roll, I sift the worms out and add them to the larger rearing bin, where again, I am keeping larger bins and sorting them by size later on. Just like mealworms, in order to conserve on room, they prefer temperatures around 80 degrees Fahrenheit for optimal growth. And now to the crickets, which are the newest addition to my roster. I have them set up in a bin I used to keep my discoid roaches in. It is taller than they can jump, which gives them little opportunity to escape. I use a heating pad between both my discoid roach and cricket colonies since they both have similar temperature requirements. It is almost a requirement to have egg crates or something to that extent in order for them to survive. They have a really bad habit of suffocating each other when their numbers get high, so providing extra surface area is almost a must. Like this packaging right here. I bent it in half and made a den of sorts out of it. The crickets tend to hang out in there a lot. Crickets have the highest stat of all feeder insects when it comes to their ability to drown themselves. They will yeet themselves first chance into a body of water in a heartbeat. I highly suggest water crystals. Water crystals will save your animals. To collect their young, crickets like to have something as close to soil as you can get. I use coconut fiber. After four or five days, I collect the dish and replace it with another. I put this dish in a cabinet underneath my leopard gecko enclosures to speed up the incubation process. After a few weeks, I release the new babies into the rearing bin for them to grow a bit and then reintroduce them into the colony. I feed them lettuce and veggies. Crickets stink for certain. They are the only ones I keep that have a smell to them at all. To combat this, you can have a cleanup crew living in your bin to help eat crickets that die and also eat the cricket poop. This will help cut down on the smell. You will still have to clean the bins out. It's going to greatly depend on the size of your colony and your ability to keep them alive. I am going to suggest once a month to do a complete clean out of their enclosure. You can transfer the crickets easily by using a toilet paper roll which will double as a hide in their enclosure. Stay on top of this and you will have less of a smell if you take better care of them. Now for the discoid roaches, by far the most simple. They are very much a set it and forget it type animal. I refresh their water every few days and give them fresh lettuce every other day since I have found lettuce doesn't tend to go bad in an every other day feeding situation. Discoid roaches thrive in humid conditions around 40 to 50 percent. Again, I live in Florida so it is naturally humid even in my home. I miss their enclosure about once a week personally, but it will depend on where you live. These guys do require warmth, so I do have a heating pad running directly under their housing 
which should trap hot air and help create a hot place with a lot of surface area for the roaches to live in. Discoid roaches will eat just about anything. I use cat food or dog treats, oats, whole wheat crackers, cornflakes, and vitamin supplements. I do a quarter of each base and blend it together with a magic bullet. It depends on how much you make at once, but I add my vitamins in last and try not to overdo it. I personally do not use an exact measurement for it, I am still figuring out the whole process. This is a really easy way to avoid spending extra money on roach chow that you can make at home for a lot cheaper. That will provide a lot of the same benefits as premium roach food as you get better at making it. You can use better ingredients like high-end cat foods, dried banana chips, etc. The better your ingredients, the better the food will be for your roaches. The batches I make, I put about a teaspoon or so of the vitamins in. I try not to overdo it. One thing to note is to be careful about adding calcium. It can make their exoskeletons harder, which can cause issues molting, so I avoid that personally. One batch of this roach food will feed your colony for a long while so store it in something airtight and feed your colony as their bowl gets empty. Their young require no special needs if you're using roach chow as they will not have to eat the frass from the larger roaches. It gives them access to better food earlier on and promotes growth. Mid recording this, I found that my crickets have taken quite a liking to the chow I make. They utterly devoured their bowl in just a few days along with lettuce. So, I highly suggest you look into making your own, as it will save you money and seems to be applicable to multiple insects. You can find various recipes online. Now let's move on to mold. This essentially applies to all feeders I have talked about. This can be a very serious colony decimating event if you let it get out of hand or do not notice it. Do not leave excess food in their bins. Give them plenty of ventilation. I cannot say it enough. Airflow is so important. And maintaining their food and how much you feed them each time. You only ever want to give them enough to last two days. Ideally, one day. I get lazy and will sometimes feed them enough for two days. I have been punished by this in the past before with mealworms, I noticed the signs that I did not have enough vent holes in my rearing bin and had placed too much moist food with them. The moisture soaked up into the bedding and settled in the bottom. The heat mixed with the moisture and food are perfect condition for mold to develop. I noticed condensation on the sides of my bin. If you see this, there is not enough airflow and you are going to get mold. My counter to this was to reduce their food and take the lid off the container to let it dry. I checked back and found clots in the substrate but no mold. The worms were able to dig through it and use it just fine and have been doing so for months now. I have never otherwise gotten mold. In our last section, we are going to talk about the dreaded grain mites. This seems to be one of the most common issues people face and it is very easily solved through preventative measures. Two common methods of prevention are freezing and baking your substrate. I personally throw the substrate I buy into the freezer where it sits for a week or longer. Then I grind it up all at once and put it into airtight containers. If you go the baking route, which I personally haven't, I've read suggestions that range 175 to 200 Fahrenheit for 20 to 30 minutes. If you happen to get grain mites, there are a few ways to combat these unwanted critters. Before we get into combating them, I'd like to thank Mealworms Australia for providing the clip I am using for this whole section of the video, along with a few proven remedies from the viewer who sent it in. You can use a number of things to trap, ensnare, and kill the mites. Petroleum jelly mixed with eucalyptus oil along with a water trap. The first thing the mites are going to do when they hatch is seek moisture. They will drown themselves within this trap as they try to drink. Those that do not die will try to get higher in the bin and escape like where we saw them congregating earlier on the bin. And how we prevent their escape or at least limit it is we smear petroleum jelly mixed with eucalyptus oil towards the tops of each of the bins around two inches wide. This will trap them and kill them. Another solution we can use is Vicks Vapor Rub. It kills them but doesn't seem to be quite as effective as the first. You can see the difference in the kill rate between the bin with plain petroleum jelly versus the mix with eucalyptus oil. It seems to be more effective. Last we have double-sided tape. As far as I can tell, it seems to have the highest trap rate. 
It may be because I can see it clearer since the surface contrasts against them well. Seemingly any of these mixes have proven to be quite effective at combating these pests. Lastly, they advised me to clean the water traps out and the lining layer, tape, petroleum jelly, vapor rub, twice a day. They do a 24 hour feeding period for their worms and then remove the food thereafter to keep the population down and allow for the traps to cull the swarm. The footage that was sent was letting it go for 36 hours to show how many mites the traps can kill. I greatly appreciate the help they provided and I hope this helps any of you who are currently in this situation. The viewer who sent these clips in said they fought them a year and a half ago and won using these tactics. Her colonies recently contracted these vermin again and these are her methods of getting rid of them. I truly appreciate the help. If you like this video and have it in your insect loving heart, give me a like, a subscribe, and hit the bell icon for future videos just like this. Again, this grain mite section of the video was provided by Mealworms Australia. And as always guys, from the gizzards and I, have a wonderful day.